Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Vantage Seminar. So today we're continuing our series of talks on lean and algebraic number theory and arithmetic geometry. And we're very happy to have Kevin Buzzard speaking on the ingredients for Fermat. And Kevin, is it all right for us to record this talk? Yes, it certainly is. Oh, great. And everyone feel free to ask questions during the talk. Okay, Kevin, take it away. Right, well, uh, thank you very much indeed uh, to the organizers for inviting me to speak. I, um, I get a lot of invitations to speak right now, but um, they're normally general audience talks, uh, which is fun to give, uh, but they do mean that I don't get to really ever talk about the details of what I've been thinking about recently. So uh, I'm extra pleased that I have the opportunity. It, in fact, it, it forced me to sit down and try and uh, put my, uh, sort of collect my thoughts and figure out what I actually, uh, what I'm actually doing. So thank you both, you know, sincerely uh, for this opportunity. So I'm gonna speak about a project uh, whose ultimate goal is a lean formalization of a proof of Fermat's last theorem. I'm gonna say something about what that means uh, so the talk's in four parts. Uh, firstly, there would just be some slightly waffly overview of the project. Uh, and then we're going to open the project because I promised people that I would open it in April. Uh, and today is the last day of April. So my hand is forced. Uh, and then after that, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to give a part of the talk that I, I never normally get to give. I'm going to give some mathematical details of um of the proof of Fermat's last theorem we'll be formalizing. And then finally, I'll say something about how to get involved. Uh, so what's this all about? Uh, for those of you that haven't been coming to the other talks, uh, it's about a computer program, well, a programming language called Lean, uh, which is, uh, uh, it's, it's like other programming languages, except as well as things like sort of numbers uh, and lists and whatever programming languages have, it also has, uh, uh, it also has sort of mathematical sort of theorem statements and theorem proofs. It, it understands the concept of logical uh, and it can do logical arguments. Uh, so this is a programming language that's sort of capable of doing mathematics. You know, it understands you know, the rules of logic and the axioms of the, the foundational system it uses, type theory. Uh, but the actual language itself and Lean Standard Library don't contain much mathematics. Um, and so that's the job of the maths library. Uh, so MathLib is a free and open source library of formally verified mathematics uh, written in Lean. And MathLib got going in about 2017, uh, so nearly seven years ago now. And uh, a, a group of sort of hundreds of people, uh, hundreds of contributors have just slowly been building, uh, sort of building, I mean, the, the initial goal was to get an undergraduate degree in there, and now we've uh, we're still doing that in some areas of mathematics. For example, we don't have much about um, Riemann surfaces, to take an example. Uh, but in other areas of mathematics, we've gone much further than an undergraduate degree. We have some um, uh, we have some sort of far more serious stuff. Uh, for example, a sort of a working theory of abelian categories. For example, a lot of homological algebra. Uh, so. We've got this this thing, this sort of this collection of all these um, mathematical theorems and proofs. All the proofs are sort of checked by computer from the axioms of mathematics. And one thing you could do with that uh, is you could realize uh, Tom Hales's formal abstracts idea. So in 2017, uh, Tom Hales gave a talk at the Newton Institute where he proposed that it would be a sort of an interesting thing if the mathematical community uh, started writing down precise statements uh, of exactly what they've been proving. Uh, so, you know, you get sort of math reviews, but uh, but the sort of the main take home is not sort of the statements of the main theorems, but it's actually computer code corresponding to those statements. So a very precise, uh, you know, sort of, uh, a, yeah, a sort of a, a digitized version of math reviews. So as I say, as far as I know, this was a, an idea due to Tom Hales, and it's something that I've been sort of really inspired by somehow. 
over the last seven years. And one possible use for such a database would be sort of training AI uh, to be good at mathematics. Uh, but the problem that we are sort of faced with now is that we have this library that has a lot of, you know, basic, basic, you know, group rings and fields and topological spaces. And then it even has things like elliptic curves and modular forms. Uh, but what's happening in modern research is somehow in some areas of mathematics, it's a long way from it's a long way from those concepts. Uh, and so what's missing is that, you know, we need a lot more definitions. Um, we need a lot more definitions uh, in our library if we want to sort of start talking about the kind of things that modern number theorists uh, and modern algebraic geometers are actually doing in 2024. And it's sort of difficult to tell people to just go away and formalize definition after definition. And, and one reason it's, uh, well, there's, here's an example of the problem we face. Uh, we've, we defined schemes several years ago, uh, but um, we don't have the definition of a curve over a field, or we don't have a definition of a proper morphism of schemes. I mean, it's not difficult to make the definition of a proper morphism of schemes, but one would have to decide what you want the definition to be, and then you would have to translate that thought into the computer language. And then more than that, uh, you have to actually prove that your definition is usable, uh, that you can prove basic theorems about proper morphisms of schemes or curves over fields. So it's not just a case of writing down the first definition that comes into your head. You've got to actually, you know, there's an art to definitions. Uh, and so why do we end up with definitions? Um, in Lean's Maths Library, it's because um, it's because people need them for projects. So people have people choose targets, you know, theorems uh, in the literature, and then they work towards proving those theorems. And on the way, they're forced to make definitions and prove basic things about those definitions. This is in practice how many things end up in the library. Uh, it's because people have targets uh, that sort of focus the mind. Uh, and I go to the number theory, the London number theory seminar week in, week out, and I see people uh, proving theorems that currently we can't even state uh, using Lean's maths library uh, because the definitions are missing. And one of the big holes in some sense uh, is that the Langlands program is a very sort of big, complicated collection of conjectures and ideas. Uh, and it's quite technical. And many of the key objects use of the Langlands program. For example, the concept of an automorphic form, uh, that's not in Lean's maths library right now. Uh, and this is in stark, con this is a very much a subject specific issue in other areas of mathematics, for example, combinatorics. Uh, all of the machinery is there uh, to formalize many, uh, so th there's several examples of uh, modern results in combinatorics, which have been formalized uh, in Lean. The most recent one being uh, Tau leading a formalization of the polynomial Freiman Rouge result, which he proved with Gowers, Green, and Manners. Uh, it was all for, it was formalized in three weeks flat by a team of people. Uh, so it would take us, you know, at least three weeks of hard work to even state uh, a lot of the sort of the main theorems in the Langlands program, uh, probably even a lot longer. So for this and several other reasons, I proposed a project to begin a formalization of a modern proof of Fermat's last theorem because I thought it would it would be a really nice project to work on. It's much harder than most of the other projects which we've worked on in the past. Uh, but it was it would sort of drive development in the direction I want the library to go. Uh, and I I put in a funding application for this um, to the EPSRC, the UK's uh, the UK's uh, funder of mathematics. And uh they bought it, they funded me, and I'm extremely grateful to them as well, uh, because it was certainly a non-standard, it was certainly very different to all the other applications I've sent to them in the past. Uh, so those are another, you know, I'm extremely grateful to the EPSRC because they've made the project a reality. Uh, and so I have five years to work on this project full time, starting in October. So the, the project hasn't started yet, it starts in October, but I've been under a lot of pressure uh, to, to start before then, <laughs> because people don't seem to realise that I have a lot of sort of teaching and marking and various other things to do until then. Uh, but actually, the teaching finished in March, uh, and I've been spending April trying to get some sort of basic 
um, to get to get the basics of the project started. And I'm uh, I'm going to reveal today uh, that basic project. So I should say it's my project in the sense that I'm leading it. Uh, but just like uh, just like Lean and Mathlib, it's a free and open source collaborative project, and um, anyone is welcome to join in. What you'll need to know to join in is you'll need to know some number theory, uh, and you'll need to know something about how to write Lean code. You'll need to know how to translate those mathematical ideas uh, into the language of the software. Uh, so I'll say more about that later on. Uh, so the question that a lot of people ask me, especially number theorists, they say, which proof am I going to formalize? Uh, and I've given some general audience talks about this, but I've never been able to explain. Um, I've never been able to explain uh, the proof because they're, you know, because I don't want to blind the audience with science. So this talk is going to have some technical uh, mathematics in it at some point uh, where I'll be able to say something about. It. So we're not going to we're not going to formalize the original Wiles and Taylor Wiles proof. Uh, because I want, you know, I want this opportunity, you know, I want to use this opportunity to formalize sort of more modern modularity lifting theorems and things like this. It would be nice if we could prove, you know, a whole lot more than what Wiles originally proved. You know, the, if you did do Wiles, then the immediate sort of reaction after finishing it would be, well, now why don't we do more things that have happened since Wiles? So we may as well do those other things first. Uh, so the route was basically designed uh with, in discussions with Richard Taylor, but sometimes people who've had discussions with Richard Taylor uh, might well know that it's a. Uh, sometimes Richard Taylor has the sort of the lion's share of the ideas, so that was a. This route was a uh, formed in discussion with Richard Taylor, uh, by which I mean he basically told me which way to go, uh, and there's no written reference for this approach right now. So I thought I would use this as some kind of excuse uh, to say something about the technical details. Uh, and the last thing I want to say before I start on the talk proper uh, is that I want to sort of temper uh, some kind of expectations. I've just said that I got funding for five years to work on this project, but having actually thought about what needs to go into it, I don't think that we're going to finish it within five years unless uh, unless either many, many humans join in or AI gets very good. Uh, I, I suspect that we won't have finished the formalization within five years. But when you look at my proposal, I was careful not to actually claim that I was going to do this. Uh, the grant proposal, I said that my main goal was to reduce the problem. Uh, so Fermat's asymmetry was proved in the 90s. I was going to reduce the problem uh, to theories which were known in the 80s. So sort of move, move the, you know, move the barrier backwards a little bit. Uh, so you could, for example, you know, you could summarize it by saying, "I'll formalize Wiles's paper, but none of the references." But of course, I'm not going to formalize Wiles's paper. You know, I'll formalize a modern version of Wiles's paper. Uh, but many of the things that Wiles assumes, uh, I won't be, I won't be concentrating on right now. Although some of the things that Wiles assumes, I can actually work around. Uh, I won't need to formalize them at all. But one thing that will come out of this talk. Uh, is that you'll see that a full formalization of Fermat's last theorem will be a tremendous amount of work. Uh, but the one of the you know I mentioned the application to formal abstracts, getting getting the system to the point where we can start stating what's happening in modern number theory. Those will come; those applications will come much sooner. You know, before we have any theorems about automorphic representations, we'll have the definition of an automorphic representation, and we'll be able to state theorems, just not. <clears throat> does not prove them. Well, it'll just take a long time to prove them. Uh, so I felt when I was preparing the project, uh, it, it sort of dawned on me that really it's just the same as preparing a graduate course. That's somehow, what, that's somehow how you could explain it because you've got a coherent story that you want to explain. And now the, the question is at what level are you trying to explain it? And I'm trying to explain it to Lean's Maths Library. And Lean's Maths Library has got a solid background in undergraduate level mathematics and knows some graduate level material. So it's like talking to a sort of a beginning PhD, beginning PhD student. Uh, so I've written the first lecture or two of this course. I'm, I'm nowhere near finishing it, uh, even the sort of a sketch of what we're doing. Uh, but I figure that now is as good a time as any to launch the project. So let me uh, let me switch over here. Uh, where do I go? Let me let me, da, 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 da. it'll be down the bottom. 
hopefully this is going to be all done in like within a minute. Uh, I'm going to change the visibility of the project. I'm going to change it to public. I'm going to make this project public. Um, I do understand those effects. And now I've got to type that. Oh, great. I can cut and paste. Uh, let's do that. And let's do that. And so, yeah, there we go. So this is and now hopefully do, 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 I'm now fiddling around on my phone. I'm going to use that. That's the secret number. Don't anybody look. Uh, I'm going to type the number 25 into my phone. And great. Uh, I think that's just happened. So there we go. Uh, and while it's thinking, I'll show you. So hopefully at some point you'll be able to see the blue. This is the blueprint of the graph. Look, we already have a proof. Of this. If you've looked at lean blueprints before, green means done. So like Fermat's last theorem is done. Uh, unfortunately, it relies on certain things that aren't done. Uh, and over here we have, in particular, a modularity lifting theorem, which is orange, and orange means nowhere near done. Uh, so that should hopefully be uh, live at some point in the near future. So there you go. Uh, OK, now let me talk a little bit about the mathematics. And um, one of the things I've noticed um, working with MathLib is that generally algebra is further ahead than analysis. And this, this might be sociological or it might not be sociological. So what I'm talking about here is that uh, it might be because there are various, there are various high profile projects more on the algebraic side of things. For example, there was a project to formalize some recent work of Peter Schultz, uh, which involved uh, which involved a bunch of homological algebra and things like that. Um, and there haven't really been sort of high profile projects and analysis. And so I wonder whether the sort of the community has just attracted more algebraic uh, people. Uh, or it might just be because formalizing algebra is easier. Uh, I don't really know. It, I, I mean, I don't know. Uh, but one thing I do know is that I personally would rather be doing algebra than analysis because I was never that good at analysis. Uh, and so it was very much um, in my interest, given that it's going to be me doing a lot of the work. Uh, and I particularly you know, want to have a lot of fun doing it uh, because... It, Basically, it's, this is for me, this is like playing a computer game, right? This is playing a really interesting computer game. Uh, and I quite like playing computer games. And I quite like thinking about mathematics. Uh, but I quite like thinking about the more sort of arithmetic side of mathematics. So I personally want to have a large amount of fun. So I'm sort of highly motivated to avoid analysis. So this was uh, when Taylor and I were sort of designing the route. Uh, I sort of tried to emphasize that we ideally wanted to minimize uh, the analytic input. And so this section is a summary of uh, his detailed response. So I'm aware that not everybody is an arithmetic geometer in the audience. So we've got a couple of, I'm going to start slow because, uh, because in fact, this is how the, this is how the repository starts. Uh, so what we're trying to prove is this claim here that there's no solution. So a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n. Uh, if a, b, and c are positive integers, and n is at least three. Uh, and the first observation uh, is that every integer at least three is either a multiple of an odd prime or a multiple of four. Uh, because if, it, if no odd primes go into it, then it's a power of two. And if it's also at least three, then it's got to be at least four, and hence a multiple of four. Um, so that reduces the problem uh, to proving Fermat. So, because obviously, if you have a solution for a, if you have a solution for n, you have a solution for all the divisors of n. So it suffices to prove Fermat's last thing, for n is four and n is an odd prime. And uh, historically, these were done a long time ago uh, because in the, the, the two smallest uh, cases, n equals four and n equals three, turn out to be uh, related to elliptic curves. n equals three is an elliptic curve. X cubed out y cubed is one. n equals four isn't. It's a genus, it's a genus uh, three curve. Um, but um, uh, but it covers a it covers an elliptic curve, and the elliptic curve has rank zero, so that's good enough. Um, so 
that's not how Fermat and Euler explained what they were doing, but that, that sort of explains why what they were doing worked. Uh, so descent uh, deals with those cases there. So to prove Fermat's last theorem, we can assume that n is at least uh, five and a prime number. Uh, so the next thing you need to do is invent zero and negative numbers, because uh, you have to do that at some point, and now is a convenient point to do that. Uh, and then actually it will suffice to prove the more general claim uh, that um, there are no non-trivial solutions to a to the l plus b to the l is c to the l in integers, whereby trivial I mean one of them is zero. So that's what we're going to prove. We're going to prove there's no solutions in uh, non-zero integers. Uh, and the way it works is by contradiction. We assume we have a counterexample. Uh, and then we start manipulating the counterexample uh, in an elementary manner. The first thing we do is cast out common factors. So we can assume they're pairwise co prime. Uh, and then the next thing we do is we permute them to assume that B is even. And how, do, how I mean, they're pairwise co prime. So at most one of them is even, but they can't all be odd uh, because odd add odd. Uh, is not odd. Uh, so one of them is even. And if it's A, you could just switch A and B. And if it's C, then this is the power of having e integers instead of naturals. If it's C, you can switch B and C and then change the signs because L is odd. Um, so we can rig it so that B uh, so that B is even. And hence B to the L is a multiple of 32, uh, which is going to be good uh, for a future application. And so now B is even, so A and C are odd, and by we can change all the signs of A, B, and C if we like to ensure that A is 3 mod 4. And so why have I just tinkered with the solution in this way? And it's because uh, we now write down this elliptic curve that just comes out of the blue. Uh, so another elliptic curve, but this is this the old elliptic curves were the elliptic curve corresponding to the equation, and this is a, an elliptic curve uh, just built uh, from a counterexample. So it's a different kind of elliptic curve introduced by El Gouache, uh, but he wasn't thinking, I mean, he was doing other things. And then Fry specifically uh, thought about proving Fermat's last theorem using uh, using this curve. Uh, and the whole this whole funny business above about permuting A, B and C around is that one can now check that this curve is semi-stable even at two. One could just ex you multiply the entire curve by uh, you, you can divide everything by uh, 64 and the fact that B is a multiple of B to the L is a multiple of 32 uh, means that this thing is now semi-stable even at two. It's, it's not difficult to check it's semi-stable everywhere else. Great. So we've got a semi-stable elliptic curve. This has a J invariant uh, and we can see from the J invariant or from just by staring at the curve uh, that the primes of bad reduction are those dividing A, B, C. So now we look at the L torsion in this elliptic curve. So same prime L, we've got very much like this counterexample with N equals a prime L. And now we look at the L torsion in the curve. And this is a two dimensional uh, Galois representation, representation of the absolute Galois group of the rationals. Uh, and um, this, uh, what can we say about this, this two dimensional mod L Galois representation? Well, if P is a good prime, uh, then the curve has good reduction at P, so the Galois representation is unramified at P. That's great. Uh, but the miracle is uh, that if P divides A, B, and C, uh, then because the curve's semi-stable at P, we can explicitly realize uh, the, the local, you know, the, the local Galois representation. We can explicitly write it down um, using the theory of the Tate curve, because the Tate curve tells us uh, that the the points of the elliptic curve over QP bar can be explicitly realized as a quotient of QP bar star by some parameter Q, the absolute value of Q less than one. That's if, that's if it's got split multiplicative reduction. If it's non-split, then there's some quadratic twist. Uh, and the periodic valuation of Q is equal to minus, the, so Q is one over J plus dot, dot, dot. You've probably seen the, J is one over Q plus dot, dot, dot. You've probably seen the power series expansion of J if you've ever seen the modular forms talk. Uh, and so the value, periodic valuation of Q is negative, the periodic valuation of J. And because you have all of these L's in the denominator, these powers of L in the denominator, the point is that the, the periodic valuation of Q is a multiple of L. Uh, that two to the eight messes the argument up at two, uh, but everywhere else it works fine. Uh, and so that means that um, 
when you look at the L torsion in the Fry curve, you're taking the Lth root of something. Um, you're taking the Lth root of something, which is sort of an Lth power times a unit. Uh, and so you get this extra cancellation that you might not expect. Uh, so, uh, and so this, you know, this take curve argument shows that rho bar is unramified at P, if P isn't L. And actually if P is equal to L, uh, then rho bar is flat at P. Uh, so in the sense that it comes from a finite flat group scheme. So what I've just, so I'm gonna, this, this is sort of accelerated lecture style. Uh, but what what the previous argument has just shown you, which is sort of Silverman, Silverman two level, uh, is that the L torsion in the Fry curve associated to a counter example is unramified outside two and L uh, and it's flat at L. And there, even the ramification at two can't be that bad uh, because the thing is semi-stable at two. Uh, I mean, it's, it's sort of, you know, the inertia group is um, upper triangular. Uh, so such a Gower representation, let's just give it a name. Let's call it hardly ramified uh, because it's sort of a useful a useful thing. So we have a hardly, so given a counterexample to Fermat's last theorem, we can get a hardly ramified Gower representation. And it's not difficult to come up with hardly ramified Gower representations. For example, we could just take the direct sum of the trivial representation and the cyclotomic character or the trivial representation. Right? Sort of trivial representations are unramified. Uh, so it's not difficult to come up with a hardly ramified representation, but the fact that it's also the L torsion in an elliptic curve is somehow too good to be true because you can't get trivial representations coming from the L torsion of an elliptic curve uh, because that would mean that that elliptic curve has got lots and lots of points of order L, which can't happen. Uh, so that was the sort of the belief at the time is that this looks suspicious. I mean, it was known in the 80s. It was known by Mazur. Uh, that this this representation couldn't be reducible, uh, but how do you how does one rule out the irreducible? I mean, Sayer already knew that this was uh, a highly suspicious looking Galois representation, uh, and Sayer's conjecture in the eighties implied that this Galois representation couldn't well modulo Ribbit's work uh, showed that it showed that it couldn't be irreducible. But that was you know ultimately Wiles's work, um, Wiles's work was somehow. You know, avoid just having to prove Sayer's conjecture and proved it couldn't be irreducible anyway. So Mazer rules out the reducible case and Wiles rules out the irreducible case and there's the contradiction. Uh, and at that point, something has just happened in the sense that I was sort of explaining a linear proof, but now we have two different paths, right? Because Mazer's theorem is a, is a huge amount of work, right? Mazer's theorem is 100 plus pages of hard arithmetic geometry. Uh, and then Wiles's theorem is sort of 200 plus pages of of all sorts of things. So uh, so now we have to decide which route we're going down, right? Because to prove Fermat's last theorem, we need to go down both routes. Uh, but Mazur's theorem was known in the 1980s. And my proposal was to reduce the proof of Fermat's last theorem to things known in the 1980s. So for now, Mazur's theorem is on hold. Uh, because what I want to do is I want to work on the bit of the, you know, the the ruling out the case where the representation is irreducible. That was not known until the 1990s. And that's the thing that I'm claiming I want to do. Uh, so I'm gonna work on the modularity lifting theorem. Now, if anybody else wants to prove Mazur's theorem, that would be great. Uh, and I've started them off, I've stated it for them. There it is, uh, using only, uh, that's using only things which were available in MathLib. This has been, uh, been developed by David Angdinata, a PhD student of mine. Uh, he's uh, him and Jun Yan Zhu uh, proved uh, I mean that that looks like a pretty innocuous statement right but but by elliptic curve we mean plain cubic right an elliptic curve isn't defined as some smooth proper group variety or whatever an elliptic curve in lean right now is an elliptic curve over a field is defined as a plain cubic so one has to prove that the group law is associative and this turned out to be a non-trivial problem they wrote a rather beautiful paper about it they came up with what looks like a novel proof of the fact um, so now we do know that it's a group, and now the claim is that uh, the number of torsion points is at most sixteen. And you see, this is this is a level of a computer game, right? If you like computer puzzle games, then maybe you'd like uh, this computer puzzle game, which is to prove Mazur's theorem uh, by typing things into a computer. Uh, but I'm not going to do it. Uh, it's it's one of my favourite parts of the proof, so I'll probably start on it uh, once we've done the modularity lifting theorem. But you know, if my dream comes true. 
then somebody else will start on it because they can work on it. They, this is the point that they can work on it completely independently. See, they don't need my work and I don't need their work. They can work on it completely independently. Uh, but I think the modularity lifting theorem will take uh, will take several years. So let me talk a little bit about the um, uh, the proof. We're gonna we're gonna prove. That, so now our job is to prove irreducibility, right? Uh, and um, so we've got this representation. It's hardly ramified and it's irreducible. And we're looking for a, and we know that L is at least five. And we're looking for a contradiction. And uh, so as I've already said several times, that at this point we're going to diverge from the original Wiles and Taylor Wiles argument. And the reason for that um, is that uh, what they what they what Wiles did was he proved uh, that the Fry curve was modular by arguing at, at three and at five. Um, and then, so the modularity lifting theorem that was, so the three torsion was modular, uh, and so the curve was modular, so the L torsion was modular, and then we can use Ribbit's level lowering theorem to prove that it's modular of weight two and level two, and so it can't be irreducible. Uh, so that was the original argument, uh, but verifying that the three torsion is modular, it uses a lot of analysis. Um, it is true that GL2 of Z mod three is solvable, but that doesn't just mean you can use cyclic base change. The argument is much harder. Uh, in particular, you, you you need to use sort of tunnels extra bits on the top of cyclic base change, and that needs non-Galois cubic base change, which is another input. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to argue at L directly. We're not going to use the three torsion. We're not going to use it yet anyway. Uh, we're going to argue at L directly, uh, which means we can avoid Langdon's tunnel, uh, and we can also avoid Ribbit, uh, which is a shame, really, because I think Ribbit's work is also rather beautiful. Um, but we do still need cyclic base change, uh, which is going to be hard. So this is a theorem of Langlands from around 1980, I guess. Um, and that's sort of very that's hard analysis. Uh, but I, I I do know of no proof of Fermat's last theorem, which avoids this bifurcation, uh, this Mazes theorem. And I also know of no proof which avoids cyclic base change. Uh, so... Uh, so I think these are sort of necessary, necessary prerequisites. Uh, and we don't just need cyclic base change. We need to know precisely when uh, an automorphic representation is in the image, is, is a base change. Uh, so we need to characterize the image. So as far as I know, uh, that means we need multiplicity one. And I'm going to be working with um, inner forms of GL2. Uh, and so we're going to need uh, multiplicity one for them. So we're going to need Jack A. Langland's as well uh i guess all of this actually maybe that's not true uh but anyway but we, we're going to need these uh we're going to need these things and at some point uh i will have ended up stating these results and then i'm just going to park them just like just like i'm parking maser uh, then i'm going to use them and i'm going to hope that others will take them on and this is this is the great thing about this sort of formalization is that you know the proof is sort of completely modular. Uh, you can let other people, you can let other people work on these things, uh, independent independent of you. So if the project gets some traction and uh, people come along and uh, they like the look of these things, then um, you know it's going to be a whole lot of people working on different projects that will all sort of come together to prove Fermat's last theorem in the end. Uh, so we can't get away from a modularity lifting theorem. Uh, so let me try and state the modularity lifting theorem uh, just to make it clear uh, what we're going to use. So it's not the modularity lifting theorem in the Wiles paper. Uh, and the in the Wiles paper, the machinery only worked for classical modular forms, right? That was all Wiles needed. Um, but now we have, um, now it's working, but it, now it works great for Hilbert modular forms. And in fact, the advantage of working with Hilbert modular forms, that's sort of the analog of a modular form, but your base field is, uh, a totally real field F. And uh, the advantage of working over a totally real field is that you can move the totally real field as well you know, to solve local problems. Uh, if your representation looks nasty to prime, then instead of making your R equals T machinery more robust, you can sort of change your totally real field to make the representation locally look simpler. Sort of stay globally the same, but locally look simpler. Uh, this is sort of the insight that was had by Taylor and others. So let me say a little bit about uh, automorphic forms of quaternion algebras, because this is something um, uh, 
which which we don't have yet, but somehow it won't be too difficult to get. So this is one of the things that we'll be able to start working on sooner rather than later. Um, so modularity theorem, the thing that Wiles introduced, or a modularity lifting theorem, the big you know the big selling point of a modularity theorem is that is that um, given a Galois representation with certain nice properties, you can find a modular form or an automorphic form. Uh, and that was sort of the breakthrough in the 90s, but sort of in the 70s, even back into the Eichler and Shimura, I guess, was the 60s. Uh, the easy way, or at least it was traditionally thought of as the easy way, it was attaching uh, attaching the representations to the forms rather than attaching the forms to the representations. So I put it in quotes, the easy way is attaching representations to forms. Uh, so as I say, this goes back to Eichler and Shimura, but as a, Frank Caligari, I think, made the observation that we've got so good at modularity lifting theorems now that arguably, uh, arguably in the, this this direction is now the hard way again. Uh, so we need everything to work in the following generality. We'll have F a totally real number field and um, and D a totally definite quaternion algebra defined over F. So that means that uh, F, F, has all, all, F has no complex places. F just has real places and for every real place, you can base extend your quaternion algebra to the reals, and then you get a quaternion algebra over the reals, and there's only two of them. And there's two by two matrices over the reals, and, and there's the Hamiltonian quaternions, Hamilton's quaternions. So uh, totally definite means that it's always the quaternions. And, and the reason for that uh, is that if you have any two by two matrices over the reals, then when you take the units, uh, you get GL2 over the reals, and then you quotient out by the center and a maximal compact. And you get the upper half plane, and then you quotient out, you know, which is a sort of a, a one complex dimensional uh, symmetric space. Uh, and then you quotient out by a discrete subgroup, and you get some Shimura manifold, which is an algebraic variety. Mm -hmm. And the dimension of that algebraic variety will be the sort of the number of places uh, where D is not the quaternions. Uh, and the moment you have positive dimensional Shimura varieties, then your definition of automorphic representation becomes very difficult in the sense that it involves analysis, uh, which I'm trying to avoid. Uh, so if we work in this totally definite situation, uh, then the Shimura variety is zero dimensional, uh, which means that for the modularity lifting theorem, we can completely avoid analysis. Uh, so this boils down to the following statement is that we can, uh, so we choose uh, a this a f is the finite adels of f, so we base change our quaternion algebra to the finite adels, and then take the units. Uh, that's now the sort of the the gigantic adelic group that our automorphic forms will be defined on. Uh, but this is there's no there's going to be no holomorphic or satisfy some differential equations definition. The the, the automorphic forms we want are just literally functions from some double coset space to the complexes. So this is a sort of a complicated. Sort of, sort of locally pro finite uh, thing in the middle, this unit group of this quaternion algebra. But when you quotient out on the left uh, by the units of the quaternion algebra and this uh, compact open subgroup, uh, then that double coset space is finite. Uh, so just like weight two modular forms of some fixed level are finite dimensional, uh, this space of weight two automorphic forms is also finite dimensional, but the proof is rather easier. Uh, so we've got that space there of. Uh, automorphic forms uh, of level u and weight two, if you like. Uh, and as I say, it's a finite dimensional complex vector space and the proof of that won't be so difficult. Uh, it boils down to the class group of F being finite, which we already have in MathLib. Uh, and this space, just like a space of classical modular forms comes with Hecker operators acting, uh, TP uh, for, all, for all primes uh, for which u is good, for which u locally at, you locally at P is just a product of uh, a maximal, yeah, is a maximal compact at P times the rest. So we get he Hecker operators for all but finitely many primes. And then the miracle, well, the, first, the relatively easy miracle is that if you have an eigenform for these Hecker operators, uh, then the eigenvalues are, are actually finite over Q. And that's because you could just replace the complexes by the rationals and the Hecker operators still act. Uh, but the big miracle is that once you have this number field E, if you choose an embedding into some piadic field QP bar, uh, oh, there's a typo that that one of the that either the P that that should be that should be E to QL bar. Um, apologies. If you choose a map from E to QL bar, 
Uh, then we get a Galois representation associated to phi, uh, such that rho of a uh, row of a Fabrenius has got trace equal to the eigenvalue of Fabrenius. Um, and this is really sort of staggering uh, because, I mean, at least the definition of a modular form somehow looks hard and deep and profound, uh, whereas, it, but it also looks like the kind of thing where you can apply algebraic geometry, right? Uh, uh, whereas these these automorphic forms here are completely combinatorial objects. Uh, so we have an eigenvector from some completely combinatorial setup. Uh, and the claim is that there's a Galois representation attached to it. And your first thought is, well, where, wherever is this Galois representation coming from? And so, of course, the answer is we need to switch to another quaternion algebra, uh, which has some geometry attached to it. So here we use Jacques A. Langlands uh, to switch to a quaternion algebra that's ramified at some of the infinite places. And then we look at the cohomology of the associated Shimura variety, but make that Shimura variety needs to have some model defined over F uh, or some, or, you know, some reflex field. Uh, so here we need a huge amount of machinery. We need all of local, well, global class field theory. We need moduli spaces of abelian varieties. We need Shimura varieties. We need canonical models of Shimura varieties. And we need SL cohomology. Well, we, I mean, I guess, it, yeah, yeah, we need SL cohomology because we might need to do the case of surfaces if the things aren't ramified everywhere. Uh, and we'll need to sort of explain the et al. cohomology of a Shimura variety in terms of automorphic representations. So that's an absolutely vast amount of mathematics. Uh, and it was all known in the 1980s, so let's skip it. So great, we don't have to worry about that yet. Uh, and now you kind of think, well, actually, I've just skipped, I mean, it's all very well skipping Mazes theorem, but I've just skipped a huge, huge chunk of stuff. I've skipped all of global class field theory, which is like a you know a 300 page textbook. And I've skipped you know lots and lots of deep theorems of Deline and others. I mean, so you do wonder whether if I keep putting it off, then maybe AI will get better, right? This is this is a this is something else that's at the back of my mind. AI is going to get better at doing this kind of translating translating uh LaTeX into lean. Uh and some people I talk to think that within five years, we actually, we might be able to get all these complicated theorems about, you know, Deleed's paper on Shimura varieties. Uh, I just put that paper into a machine and then we just get lean code out that pretty much works. So because AI is moving so fast right now, yada, yada, yada. I mean, I just like, and I don't know, right? I don't know, but to be quite frank, I'm a little bit skeptical uh, that we're going to get that far that quickly, but I don't know. Uh, and one thing I do know is that AI is sort of moving very, very, very fast right now. And I also know uh, that sort of bit, literally billions of dollars is going into this kind of question. There's, there's there's startups, there's big funded companies, there's all sorts of people trying to figure out how to get, because large language models are rubbish at maths, right? There's people trying to get, trying to figure out how to get AI better at mathematics. So I have no idea how how well they're going to do. Uh, but I'm going to keep putting off stuff like this and I'm going to do my modularity lifting theorem. And then in two or three years' time, when that's done, we'll have a look at we'll have a look at where AI is at that point and we'll see if it's of any use for us. Can I ask a question here? I mean, Go. Are you saying that AI might almost get better using the lean that you're producing? Yeah, maybe. I, yeah, yeah, AI will train on lean's maths library and it will look at LaTeX and it will try and figure out how to translate LaTeX into lean and try and figure out how to translate lean into LaTeX. And, and you know, maybe it will get so good that by five years time, I do, it's all a complete waste of time because all you do is you just feed Wiles's annals paper into the machine and the machine just does it all for you. Uh, but yeah, it's I, I I'm not saying anything about AI because I don't know the first thing about AI really. Uh, but some people are saying that that you know this sort of thing is a possibility. You you train it on some stuff and then it gets very very good very very quickly. But who knows? Who who knows? I I just don't know. Uh, so back to the modularity lifting theorem. We only care about um, gamma one of n for n square three. We don't have to worry about. Uh, <laughs> We don't have to worry about p squared dividing the level. See, this is one of the advantages of letting the totally real field move. Uh, it's because you can make your elliptic curve semi-stable, for example. Uh, uh, we need to know uh, that the Galois, we, we'll need to know that this Galois representation attached to the former Bayes local global compatibility. 
uh, at least away from L, uh, but even at the bad primes. But that hopefully is not going to be too bad. And we'll need to know it's flat at L if we have full level structure at L. That's, that's going to be relatively straightforward, I think. Um, but again, all of this was known in the 1980s. So right now, we're going to skip all that. I, I'm going to assume local global compatibility. And anyway, that that this somehow doesn't look too scary to me. A lot, some of the other stuff looks quite scary. But sort of gamma one of P, of P, you know, is, is not so bad. So here's the modularity lifting theorem. We've got F totally real. We'll assume it's got even degree. Uh, we've got L at least five. Uh, we've got a finite set of primes of F. Uh, they're the bad primes, but all the primes above L are going to be good. Uh, and we've got a Gower representation, and it's going to be unramified outside S and L. And it's going to be flat at L, uh, and it's going to have cyclotomic determinant. And uh, of the bad primes, I'm going to assume that it sort of locally looks upper triangular with sort of tame characters on the diagonal. That's what this sort of statement boils down to here. Uh, so... Uh, that's yeah. It's gonna look, it's gonna look like that, uh, and then the modularity lifting theorem uh, says that if we've got this representation rho, and if we know that its reduction is modular uh, of level gamma one s, uh, and if also the reduction is absolutely irreducible even when restricted to F C to L, then I claim that rho is modular. So this is the this is the modularity lifting theorem. We only need it at sort of uh, sort of square free level. Uh, and uh, one reference that I've been looking at is uh, Richard Taylor's graduate course that he gave in Stanford in 2018. Uh, although the proof that the proof wasn't sort of the, the proof was known before that uh, is I, I'm finding it hard to find the proof in the literature, but there's several sort of near misses. There's a survey paper by Toby G that sort of nearly states it, but uh, doesn't quite have has a slightly stronger hypothesis that is not necessary uh, in this case. Uh, so anyway, it's it's I, I, it's slightly hard to point to where this is proved in the literature, but um, it's certainly known to the experts. And so now, how is this going to work? We've got the L torsion in the Fry curve associated with a counterexample, uh, and now and now we use this Moray Bayi trick. We write down a modular curve. So Wiles had a three five trick, and we're going to do a P L trick. So we write down a certain modular curve parameterizing elliptic curves whose L torsion looks like row bar and whose P torsion uh, is induced from a character. Uh, and then by Moray Bayi, we can find sort of a global point on this modular curve that sort of locally is very well behaved. And in particular, locally it's induced at P and it looks like row bar. Uh, and yeah, it looks like row bar globally because the totally real field will be disjoint from the kernel of row bar. Uh, so we get some random elliptic curve defined over some totally real field that we can't control at all. And in particular, it might not be a solvable extension of Q, but we have some elliptic curve defined over this big totally real field. And the and the L torsion in A looks like rho bar, uh, but the P torsion in A is, is dihedral. Uh, and so it's certainly modular mod P. Uh, and then the modularity lifting theorem can be used to prove that the curve is modular. And then from the curve being modular, uh, the L torsion is modular. Uh, so rho bar is potentially modular. Uh, and so we haven't proved that it's modular, but we have it's potentially modular. And then we just use these tricks due to Taylor. Well, this is Carey Vantenberger. Uh, we lift rho bar to a characteristic zero representation, which is also uh, very, very, very unramified. Uh, it's flat at L uh, and unramified outside 2L. Uh, and then we apply the modularity lifting theorem again uh, to prove that this lift is potentially modular. Uh, and once we have that it's potentially modular, we then use this sort of Brouwer trick uh, that Taylor spotted uh, to put rho, even though we can't prove that rho is modular, we can, it's potentially modular. So we can put so we can put the restriction into a compatible fa a compatible family of L adic representation as L is varying. Uh, and then we use this sort of Brower induction trick introduced by Taylor um, to put Rho itself into a compatible family. And this compatible family, uh, now it's unramified outside. You know, it's got level two. Um, and uh, and now finally, the, the prime three does get a look in. We specialize that family to three. Uh, and now we look at what's going on at three. And it turns out that what's going on is sort of too much to ask for. Because now, just like Tate proved that there were no, Tate proved Sayers conjecture for level one forms 
over f2 bar by proving that sort of the uh proving that sort of the gap the, the representation would cut out a, a number field which is sort of too unlikely to exist so just the same argument works here we've got a three addict representation unramified outside two and three and flat at uh, flat at three uh and we we understand its behavior locally at two so we reduce row three uh, modulo three and now we've got a mod three representation we look at the kernel of that representation and it's a number field that possibly that we don't we can't bound the degree yet uh, but we can bound the root discriminant uh, using uh using fontaine's ideas flatness at three uh, Fontaine should have flatness at three, gave you a bound on the root discriminant at three. So we get a bound on the root discriminant, and now by odd Lisko, uh, we get bounds for the degree of K, uh, and that and that ultimately takes us to a contradiction. So, I mean, I, I should I should say a lot more about what's going on there, but I don't have time. Uh, and so that's the proof we're done. Uh, and that's all I'm going to say about uh, mathematics. So now, now we have sort of five minutes of soft stuff, and then that's the end. So stating the modularity lifting theorem, actually, we're nearly there. We've got Adele's, thanks to Maria Inesh, uh, my former postdoc, who uh, she formalized Adele's of a global field. We've got quaternion algebras. We've certainly got number fields, totally real fields we don't have, but they're easy. Uh, I ran a lean course at Imperial this year, and the student is examined by projects. Uh, and as part of, and I proposed some projects to the students uh, to do compatible families of Gower representations and Frobenius elements. Uh, various undergraduates did them, uh, so they're on the way. They're not in Bathlib yet, but the code exists. We've got to PR it. Uh, and so actually um, stating uh, stating uh, that given an automorphic representation, we get a Galois representation, this is now sort of a viable. The Hecker operators will be easy. Uh, so we're very close to being able to state this. Uh, so that's something, certainly that sort of obvious first goal. Uh, prove it, proving it will be a huge amount of work, as I say, most of which I'm going to skip, uh, but stating it is certainly something that we can start working on now. Uh, and another thing that we can start working on now is all of those easy reductions at the beginning. Uh, uh, the, the reduction to the Fry curve is, is very easy and essentially all done. But stuff like basic facts about uh, elliptic curves, like if it's, the curve's got good reduction, then the L torsion's got good reduction. Sorry, the L torsion's unramified. Um, and the theory of the Tate curve, that's, you know, that, that's this Silverman 2, a determinant of the L, determinant of the L torsion, or the Tate module is the cyclotomic character. Uh, that's going to need the V pairing, that's Silverman 1, I guess. Uh, J invariance, that's Silverman 1. And computing the J invariance of the Fry curve, proving the Fry curve semi-stable. All, all of these things are very basic, very basic stuff, but none of those things are in MathLib. Uh, so those are going to be lots, you know, we're we're right there, ready to have a lot of fun uh, teaching lean all of these things right now. Uh, so that's another place where we can start. Uh, how's the formalization going to work? It's going to use uh, Patrick Masso's lean blueprint software. Uh, this is uh, I should I should particularly thank Patrick because uh, uh, I've been DMing him frantically over the last twenty four hours, saying, "Oh, can you do this? Can you do this? Oh, this doesn't work. Uh, you know, can you can you fix this?" Uh, he's been very proactive in fixing things. So I'm extremely grateful uh, to Patrick, both for writing the software and for um, and for making it work in my situation. Because uh, I was using some early version. Uh, you don't want to know the details. I was using some early version of the software and, uh, and then things needed tweaking. Um, so the most famous component of this software is the blueprint graph. Maybe lots of people like to show blueprint graphs. Let me just show you. This is the blueprint graph. Uh, I wonder... I wonder if this actually now works. If I click on Blueprint, this. Uh, no, so there we go. Bro so there we go. We the Blueprint's now broken, but uh, I'll fix the Blueprint after this talk, I think. Let's not worry about that now. Uh, but the thing I really want to tell you about is the LaTeX exposition of the argument, um, because that's that's how it's going to work. Uh, I'm writing a LaTeX document, uh, and it's what powers the project. Uh, and so I think I'm going to be spending a lot of time writing LaTeX rather than writing Lean. I'm going to write detailed LaTeX proof of intermediate results. And then an arbitrary person around the world uh, can choose a blue node. You can see some of the nodes are blue. Uh, so some of these, you see this, this, this node here says that, well, you can see what it says. If a, see, this is LaTeX. If it is an elliptic curve over a field K, 
And if you've got two K algebras and a morphism of K algebras, then the induced morphism of points uh, isn't just a random, isn't just a morphism of sets, it's a group homomorphism. Uh, and then there's you know, various trivial facts about things like this, uh, proving that that, proving that, basically proving that the group, the, the functor of points is functorial. Um, so you can look at what needs doing, you can tr translate the latex, if you understand the latex proof, you can translate it into lean. If you understand the latex proof, and you understand some lean, you can translate it into lean. You know, it's a you know, short, this is a short project, you can do it in an hour or two, make a pull request. And if the proof compiles, I can merge the PR. And even if I've got no idea who you are, uh, then I don't need to worry about you know, whether you're a crank or whether you've written nonsense because the computer checks that the proof works. So that's the power of the blueprint. It enables collaboration at scale. Uh, and it's something I'm very excited to be working with. So we'll be managing the formalization uh, on the Lean Zulip, which is sort of the Lean chat room uh, on the Fermat's Last Theorem stream. I'm going to be posting updates explaining what's ready to be done, and then people will claim them and work on them. Uh, if you're interested, uh, if you're interested in uh, getting involved, uh, then just search up Mathematics in Lean and you'll find a, a textbook written for mathematicians, uh, which will teach you uh, how to do basic undergraduate level mathematics in Lean. Uh, and as is probably clear from the talk, I'm gonna need a lot of help, right? If it's just me working on this, it's going to go extreme. You know, I, I, if it was just me, then it won't be finished before I die, I suspect. Uh, but if other people join in, uh, then I think that, uh, I think that you know, there's a chance we can make this happen. Uh, but at the end of the day, I fully intend to have a lot of fun uh, teaching a computer a modularity lifting theorem. And that's the end of the talk. Thank you very much indeed for listening.